Hello and welcome to the Week 7 podcast for LWS 011 Journalism Law. I'm Peter Black. This week we are continuing to look at some of the law as it relates to information. So last week we looked at keeping secrets and confidential information. This week we're looking at how we let that information get free. That is through freedom of information laws. So we'll have a bit of an introduction to the FOI regime um, before looking at the process that you need to go through to make requests, the exemptions, the appeal process, before touching on uh, some of the problems that have been identified with respect to the freedom of information regime. So let's get into it. Now, journalists may be able to bypass some of the issues related to disobedience, contempt, as well as confidentiality if you have the time and resources to lodge freedom of information requests for government information. The democratic purpose of the FOI regime in Australia is to confer a legal right on members of the public to access information held by the government. And this has been a feature of Australia's legislative landscape since 1982, at least at a federal level. The purpose of this federal act, the Freedom of Information Act of 1982, was to open government activity to public scrutiny so as to enhance accountability and encourage citizen engagement with public administration, notions that are seen to be at the very foundations of a democratic society. Now, freedom of information is now an internationally recognised right. It's recognised in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as Articles 8 and 42 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. And part of the reason we see uh, freedom of information recognised in such a way internationally is that the idea of open government has a strong footing in democratic political theory, and indeed it's been a hallmark of a number of Western democratic countries for some time. Now, the first legislation relating to freedom of information occurred all the way back in Sweden in 1766. Uh, Finland ultimately took the same step nearly 200 years later in 1951, followed by the United States of America in 1966, and several other European countries in the 1970s. We now have more than 80 countries around the world that have national freedom of information legislation regimes. It's worth noting Australia's unique place in history here in the sense that Australia was the first nation with a Westminster or parliamentary style of government to enact freedom of information legislation. Now, when freedom of information legislation was first being considered by the Australian Parliament in the 1970s, the Senate Standing Committee on Constitutional and Legal Affairs set out three broad reasons as to why FOI legislation is important. First, freedom of information provides a mechanism for individuals to see what information is held about them on government files and to seek to correct that information if they consider it wrong or misleading. Secondly, freedom of information enhances the transparency and accountability of policy making, administrative decision making and government service delivery. And that thirdly, a community that is better informed can participate more effectively in the nation's democratic process. All, I think, quite persuasive reasons. A fourth reason, however, has also emerged, that namely that there is greater recognition that information gathered by government at public expense is a national resource and should be available more widely to the public. This is due in considerable part to developments in information technology use in the government and non-government sectors since the Freedom of Information legislation was enacted. So what then are the objects of the Freedom of Information Act? We find this in Section 3 of the Commonwealth Act. Uh, the main object is to give the Australian community access to information held by the government of the Commonwealth by requiring agencies to publish information and by providing for a right of access to documents. The Parliament intends by these objects to promote Australia's representative democracy by increasing public participation in government processes with a view to promoting better informed decision making and increasing scrutiny, discussion, comment and review of the government's activities. The Parliament also intends by these objects to increase recognition that information held by the government is to be managed for public purposes and is a national resource. The Parliament also intends um, that this will facilitate and promote public access to information promptly and at the lowest possible cost. 
Now that comes from the Commonwealth Act, um, but there is similar provisions contained in the relevant Queensland legislation, which is the Right to Information Act and the Information Privacy Act, together with the Office of the Information Commissioner. We're going to focus mainly in this discussion on the Commonwealth legislation. But, as I said, similar notions apply in the state of Queensland. We're really using the Commonwealth one as a bit of an example or a case study. Now, the Freedom of Information Act that was introduced in 1986, can, 1982 rather, contains six key principles. First, that all members of the public enjoy an equal right of access to government documents. So an FOI applicant is not required to explain their reason for seeking access or to demonstrate a special need for or interest in a document. All of the public have an equal right of access to government documents. Second, the right of access to government documents is a legal right. A government agency or minister has no residual discretion to deny documents upon request and can only do so if a document is exempt from disclosure under the Act. Third, a person who is denied access to a document can appeal against the decision of the agency or minister to an independent tribunal, which can review the merits of that decision and make a fresh determination that is binding on the agency or minister. Four, at all stages of the freedom of information processing and review process, the agency or minister bears the onus of establishing that their decision is justified, and that becomes important. Fifth, agencies must publish information that explains their role and work, such as their decision-making powers, organisational structure, categories of documents, FOI procedures, and policies and guidelines applied in making decisions that affect members of the public. And six. An agency or minister may grant access to any document, even an exempt document, unless prevented by a secrecy provision in another statute from doing so. Now, the 2010 reforms built on these key FOI principles. So the uh, Information Commissioner Act of 2010 and the Freedom of Information Amendment Reform Act of 2010 made some broad changes. There is a new presumption now of openness and of maximum disclosure. Agencies are required to proactively publish as much information as practicable on the agency website. It's also made it easier for members of the public to make FOI requests. The process is designed to be inexpensive and informal, so that it's also easier to review FOI decisions from, for a person to question or challenge a decision by an agency or minister. There's two new independent statutory officers, the Information Commissioner and the Freedom of Information Commissioner, and these two play a leadership role in securing the FOI principles and objectives. And also, finally, the FOI privacy and information policy are integrated into a single office. So, that's the, some of the key principles that underpin the 2010 Act. Now, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. This is an independent statutory agency established um, by the Australian Information Commissioner Act. It reports to the Minister and falls within the portfolio of the Attorney General. This is headed by the Australian Information Commissioner, supported by the Freedom of Information Commissioner, the Privacy Commissioner and the staff of the office. And it has three main functions. It has privacy functions, uh, which uh, come under the Privacy Act, which we looked at in a previous week. Then there are freedom of information functions as well as information commission functions. Let's focus, however, on the freedom of information process. So the Act apply or provides that every person has a legally enforceable right to obtain access to a document of an agency and an official document of a minister unless the document is exempt. And this is provided for in Section 11 of the Act. So to be able to understand the scope then of the FOI regime, we need to consider three key terms that are contained in Section 11. What is meant by an agency, what is meant by a minister, and what is meant by a document. So let's begin by looking at agencies. Now, most Australian government agencies are subject to the Freedom of Information Act, including all departments of the Australian Public Service, an agency that is a prescribed authority, which includes agencies established under an enactment or order in council and bodies declared by regulation, as well as a Norfolk Island authority. The Act contains a detailed definition of statutory bodies and office holders that are to be treated as either separate agencies or as part of another agency. It is worth noting that some Australian agencies are expressly excluded from the operation of the Act. 
This list includes Aboriginal land councils and land trusts, the Auditor General, the Australian Government Solicitor, the Australian Industry Development Corporation, and significantly and importantly, security intelligence agencies such as ASIS, ASIO, uh, IGES, and the Office of National Assessments. Now, some agencies are also exempt in relation to particular documents. So, for example, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and uh, SBS are exempt in relation to their program material. Australia Post, Comcare, CSIRO and Medicare in relation to their commercial activities. And the Reserve Bank in relation to its banking operations and exchange control matters. In terms of how far it extends to courts, the Act only applies to courts in relation to documents that concern matters of an administrative nature, and not to documents relating to the judicial role of a court in conducting proceedings and deciding cases before it. Similarly, the official secretary to the Governor-General is subject to the Act only in respect of matters of an administrative nature, and not functions discharged by the Governor-General under the Constitution or an enactment. Now, as I've said, all agencies and ministers are exempt from the operation of the Act in relation to intelligence agency documents. For example, a document originating with or received from ASIO, as well as defence intelligence documents. These are documents that originated with or were received from the Department of Defence and relate to the collection, reporting or analysis of operational intelligence or special access programs under which a foreign government provides restricted access to technologies. This exemption also applies to those parts of documents that contain a summary of or information from an intelligence document or a defence intelligence document. So, that is what is meant by agencies. Now let's look at what is meant by ministers. The Freedom of Information Act treats a minister's office as being separate from the portfolio department. So a minister's office is thus responsible for processing FOI requests that are directed to the minister and for making a decision on a request. The same applies to parliamentary secretaries. Now, the Act applies to an official document of a minister. This means documents relating to the affairs of an Australian government agency and not documents of a personal or party political nature or relating to the minister's electorate affairs. The Act applies only if the document is in the possession of the minister including a document that has passed from the minister's possession if he or she is entitled to access the document and the document is not a document of an agency. The effect of that provision is that a request cannot be made under the Act to a former minister. Any records transferred by a former minister to the National Archives of Australia will be available under the Archives Act when the open access period is reached. Now, it is open to a minister to seek advice and assistance from a portfolio department in dealing with an FOI request. The Minister's Office can transfer a request to another agency if the agency also holds the relevant um, documents or the request relates more closely to its functions. So that's what is meant by the term ministers. What then is meant by the term documents? Now the right of access conferred by the Freedom of Information Act doesn't apply to information, it actually just applies to documents. So what then is meant by a document? So a document is defined broadly in the Act as including any paper or other material on which there is writing or a mark, figure or symbol, electronically stored information, maps, plans, drawings and photographs, and any article from which sounds, images or writing are capable of being reproduced. However, document does not include material retained for reference purposes that is otherwise publicly available, for example, library books or cabinet notebooks. The term document extends to draft letters and papers that have not been destroyed, personal correspondence on agency files, personnel files of agency staff, diaries and calendars, post-it notes, file covers, card index, information stored on computer hard drives or servers, laptop computers and portable storage devices used by agency staff, emails, DVD, sound recordings, films and video footage and microfilm. So again, quite a broad definition of what is meant by a document. The FOI Act applies to a document of an agency if it is in the possession of the agency, whether created in the agency or received in the agency. Thus, the Act applies to documents or the information in documents 
received from third parties, including state and foreign governments, and documents an agency has downloaded from an external website or a shared database. The FOI Act, however, does not apply to government uh, records that are accessible to the public under other arrangements. So, for example, this applies to the Library, Historical and Museum collections of the Australian War Memorial, National Library of Australia, National Museum of Australia, National Archives of Australia, and the National Film and Sound Archive. So, that now gives us a good working understanding of the sorts of documents that can be requested under the Commonwealth uh, FOI regime. Now, let's have a look at the process that you need to follow to uh, apply to access these documents. Now, the Act says that every person has a legally enforceable right to obtain access to documents under the Act. This means the person making the request does not have to be an Australian citizen or resident, nor be in Australia at the time of making the request. A request can also be made by a company, an organisation or a state government agency. Now, in principle, all people have an equal right of access. The FOI Act states that a person's right of access is not affected by any reason they give for seeking access or the agency's belief as to why the person is seeking access. So usually the intent of the person is going to be irrelevant. However, in practice, there are situations in which a person's identity is relevant to whether access will be granted. So, for example, a person is more likely than other members of the public to be granted access to documents that contain their own personal information and a business is more likely than others to be granted access to documents that contain information about its commercial or financial affairs. There are five requirements that must be met uh, for a request to qualify as a request under the Act. So it must be in writing. Uh, and indeed, many agencies have a pro forma request form on their website, but you don't have to comply with that pro forma request. It just has to be in writing. There must be what's described as an FOI flag, that is to say that the request must state that it is an application made under the FOI Act. Agencies should take a flexible approach when assessing whether an applicant has met this criteria. The next requirement is that it has to describe the document that is being sought. Now, the document need not be precise. The FOI Act simply requires that the request provide such information as is reasonably necessary to enable a responsible officer of the agency to identify the document. There must be a return address, so the request must provide an address, which may be an email address, to which notices may be sent by the agency to the applicant, uh, and it must be sent to the agency. So an applicant must send the request to the agency, either to a postal address provided in a current telephone directory, by hand delivery to such address or electronically by email, facsimile or online lodgement. Indeed, many agencies have provided an online lodgement facility on their website. An agency also has a duty to provide reasonable assistance to a person to make a request that meets those five FOI Act requirements. Now, assistance from agencies should be provided as needed either before a request is made or after an incomplete request is received. The assistance can be provided informally by telephone or in writing by email or letter. An agency has two further obligations. First, to provide reasonable assistance to a person to direct their request to the appropriate agency. And secondly, to consult with an applicant before refusing a request on the basis that it does not adequately identify the documents being requested or would substantially and unreasonably divert the resources of the agency from its other business. Now, once it has received a request, there are a number of timelines uh, that are relevant. So there is uh, a time frame for notifying receipt of request. So upon receiving a request, an agency must, as soon as practicable, but within 14 days, take reasonable steps to notify the applicant that the request has been received. There's also a time frame relating to notifying a decision. The agency must notify the applicant of its decision as soon as practicable, but within 30 calendar days after the day on which the request is received. If a decision is not notified in this period and the period has not been extended, as, uh, the agency is deemed to have made a decision refusing to provide access. The applicant may then seek a review of that decision. And then time frame in terms of providing access. 
If the agency decides to provide access to documents in response to a request, access must be provided as soon and reasonably practicable after the applicant has been notified of the decision, the applicant has paid any charges for access set by the agency, and any opportunities a third party has to seek review of the decision to grant access have run out. Now, there are, however, six ways that this 30-day processing period can be extended. That is by consultation, by agreement, uh, an information commissioner extension where you've got a complex and voluminous request, or an information commissioner extension where there is a deemed request, settling a charge, or clarifying the scope of request. Now, it's worth noting with this FOI regime that the applicant still does have to, in some instances, or will um, be entitled to charge for access. So what does, uh, what does the law say with respect to how much can be charged? Because you could have the situation, if the charges were prohibitive, that you would in effect nullify the freedom of information regime. So this is what the law says. An agency or minister has a discretion to impose or not impose a charge for access to a document, though no charge may exceed the charges set out in the charges regulations. Now, when determining the appropriate charge, the agency or minister should take account of the lowest reasonable cost objective stated in the objects clause of the Act. Now, a charge can be imposed for the staff time and resources expended in processing an FRI request for a document and for postage, photocopying or reducing information to a written document. Other important principles when we're talking about charges here. That is that there is no application fee for making a request for documents, for amendment of personal records, or for seeking external internal review or review by the Information Commissioner. The first five hours of the decision-making time are free, and an agency may impose a lower charge than that set out in the charges regulations. Application fees may apply for requests for review by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal unless the applicant is exempt or the register waives the fee on grounds of financial hardship. Now, we've looked so far at the types of documents that are covered by the FOI regime. We have looked at the process, and we've also looked at what can be charged. It's also worth noting, though, that there are exemptions. And indeed, there are two broad classes of documents that may be exempt from disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. So there are exempt documents and conditionally exempt documents. So when we're talking about exempt documents, we're talking about documents affecting national security, defence or international relations, cabinet documents, or documents affecting law enforcement and protection of public safety. When there is conditionally exempt documents, where access is conditional upon meeting a public interest test, such as documents affecting Commonwealth state relations, or documents that are used for deliberative processes. So, the first class of exempt documents um, are not required to be disclosed in response to an FOI request. Nevertheless, a decision maker has a discretion to disclose the documents where no other law prohibits their release. So, this is the list of documents that are exempt in this first class of exemption. So, documents affecting national security, defence or international relations. Cabinet documents. Documents affecting law enforcement and protection of public safety. Documents to which secrecy provisions of enactment apply. Documents subject to legal professional privilege. Documents containing material obtained in confidence. Documents the disclosure of which would be contempt of parliament or court. Documents disclosing trade secrets or commercially valuable information and electoral rolls and related documents. Now, the second type of uh, exemption is a little bit trickier. This is, as I've said, conditionally exempt documents. That is, the exemption is conditional upon meeting a public interest test. So access must generally be given to a conditionally exempt document unless disclosure would be contrary to the public interest at the time of the decision. So the types of documents that are conditionally exempt then include documents affecting Commonwealth state relations, Documents that are used for deliberative processes, so internal working documents. Documents affecting the financial or property interests of the Commonwealth. Documents about certain operations of agencies. Documents involving personal privacy. Documents involving business affairs. Documents relating to research by specified organisations. As well as documents affecting Australia's economy. Now, once a document has met that threshold of being conditionally exempt, 
the decision maker must then apply the public interest test to assess whether access to the document should be given. Now, application of the public interest test involves weighing up factors for and against disclosure to determine whether access at the time would, on the balance, be contrary to the public interest. In this process, a decision maker needs to identify factors favouring disclosure and factors not favouring disclosure, and to determine the comparative importance to be given to those factors. Now, the Act outlines factors favouring disclosure that must be taken into account in applying the public interest test. These factors are whether access to the document would promote the objects of the Act, inform debate on a matter of public importance, promote effective oversight of public expenditure, or allow a person to access his or her own personal information. However, the Act also outlines factors decision makers must not take into account in deciding whether access to the document would, on balance, be contrary to the public interest. These factors are access to the document could result in embarrassment to the government or a loss of confidence in the government. Access to the document could result in any person misinterpreting or misunderstanding the document. The author of the document was or is of high seniority in the agency to which the FOI request was made, and access to the document could result in confusion or unnecessary debate. These things must not be taken into account. If you are ultimately unhappy with the decision, um, there are two main avenues a person may take to have an access grant decision or access refusal decision reviewed. There is internal agency review as well as review to the Information Commissioner. Where a person is dissatisfied with that review, they can apply to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal for a review, and in some limited circumstances, go on to the Federal Court of Australia or the Commonwealth Ombudsman. So that then, in a nutshell, is an overview of the FOI regime in Australia, at least at a federal level. This scheme, while important, is not without its critics. Uh, and the Australian Press Council has identified five key shortcomings of the FOI legislation. First, many requests to obstruct it on the ground, they would unreasonably divert an agency's resources. Second, time delays. Three, cost. Four, too many exemptions, greatly reduce the amount of information. And fifth, arbitrary decisions by FOI officers on classification of documents. And the textbook will walk you through two case studies that illustrate some of these problems with the FOI regime. McKinnon and Secretary of the Department of Treasury and Nationwide News and the General Manager of Leichhardt Council. And I would encourage you to take some time to read those in the textbook. This then brings us to an end of our discussion on the freedom of information laws in Australia. Thank you.